shout out to all of you for making the effort to come in the middle of the hot July in Palm Beach to learn some Torah, especially right now, as we were discussing a little earlier, we are find ourselves in the three week period um, in the Jewish calendar, which is the time that we commemorate and mourn the destruction of the first and second temple in Jerusalem, uh, culminating in the ninth of Av, which is in two weeks time. So that's why the third class is not gonna be on a Tuesday, uh, but it's gonna be the day after because the third Tuesday is actually Tisha B'Av, uh, which is considered the saddest day of the Jewish year, the Jewish calendar. And notwithstanding all the tragedies and the <coughs> terrible history, which some of it we'll touch upon over the next couple of weeks, um, as the generations progressed, as we got closer and closer towards the times of Mashiach, it became more and more important to focus less on the past and more on the future, mm -hmm. uh, specifically the third Beit HaMikdash, the third temple. And this brings us to a very uh, powerful and brilliant institution from the Lubavitch Rebbe. So in addition to the, uh, the fact that we're sitting here learning Torah, which itself is tremendous merit and brings a lot of blessing for this time, but specifically we're learning a topic that the Rebbe was very passionate about. And he instituted in the later years, uh, I'm not sure the exact year, in the 80s, um, this idea that people should learn during the three weeks, they should learn about the laws of the temple and specifically the insights of the temple and, and to really delve into all the different concepts and the future temple and just to get involved in the topic. And he spoke about this many times, uh, even time, there were moments where actually the Rebbe expressed disappointment at his Hasidim and his disciples for not taking him seriously. So there's one particular occasion that comes to mind where the Rebbe uh, was actually very sharp and upset when he came down to the synagogue and he found the, the students were like kind of sitting around waiting for him. They wanted to, you know, see the Rebbe. And he, he was very upset that they were just sitting around, not actually studying. It was the eve of Tisha B'Av, when that's like, you know, the one, that's a good time to really learn these laws, learn these discussions. And he went back to his office and he, you know, he expressed his disappointment to his secretary. Um, and to really bring this home, he, he took the lead and took the initiative. And every time, at every opportunity, every occasion, uh, especially on Shabbat, the Rebbe would take a concept from the laws of the temple and spend hours on it and discussing it and dissecting it and analyzing all the different opinions and never want to leave us just on an on a academic discussion. He would actually always give insight and spiritual, mystical application of these ideas. So this is a very, very uh, important concept. And, and the essential idea was that this is something the Rebbe would always quote, uh, first time he actually made this institution, um, was based on a medrash. There's a medrash, a fascinating medrash, that describes Ezekiel the prophet. So Ezekiel was, uh, lived towards the end of the first temple. He was already getting, uh, he had already heard the prophecies from the previous prophets about the future destruction that was imminent and the eventual 70 year exile. So this is the <clears throat> first temple era, the Babylonian exile, which was lasted 70 years before the second temple. That's where we have the Purim story, right? Bang in the middle, in between. So Ezekiel the prophet is giving a prophecy as the temple is about to be destroyed. And God is showing him all the different uh, uh, instructions and, and, and uh, measurements of the third Beit HaMikdash, the future. So actually a lot of what we know, if you go online, you see a lot of different pictures. We'll see probably soon uh, in the slide of what the temple looks like. A lot of it's based on Ezekiel's prophecy. Obviously we don't, it's, it's very difficult. You have to be a really, um, brilliant uh, architect to look at the Bible and dissect based on those, you know, measurements, what exactly it looks like. Um, but this is where we had, it's one of our primary sources. And the Medrash relates that Ezekiel turns to God and he says, you know, God, master of the universe, this is so inappropriate. The, ter the, the temple's about to be destroyed. The Jews are gonna go into exile. They're gonna go through a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. And what are you doing right now? You're giving me uh, prophecies about how, you know how to build the third temple and you're getting into such detail and the measurements and the poles and the tools and the different uh, elements it's it feels like you're adding salt into the wound and God says because my children are exiled therefore the house should not be built and God said to Ezekiel um, teach them study these laws and I will consider it as if it having been built in other words and this was a very important point the Rebbe would elaborate on a lot the mere study of these laws it's not just a compensation. It's not like, oh, you know, too bad. We don't have a temple, so we'll do the next best thing, which is learn about it. But actually, the learning about it is itself part and parcel of the construction process. The practical aspect of, you know, a physical structure we don't have yet. God willing, that will happen very soon. 
but the studying about it is just as much as part of the building. And it's considered like we're already participating in the building, not just in some theoretical sense, and it's not just a, an apologetic, but in a very real sense. Um, God himself is telling Ezekiel, I consider it as if you are fulfilling the building of the temple. And that's why it's so important to study these laws, especially during this time, because the best way to transform these days of mourning to joy is to actually begin to build. So we have with us um, the mitzvah to guard the temple. There's a mitzvah to have guards stationed at the temple. And just in case you think this is to do with the security purposes, the Ramam clarifies that it had nothing to do with any, any negativity. It wasn't about fear of, uh, of thieves or, or unwelcome guests, but it was simply to honor, to honor the, uh, the, the temple. Um, in fact, the proof of this is, as the Ram goes on, it's not in the source sheet, but he says who was responsible for being these guards? It was the Levites and the priests. Now, seemingly, you would think, you know, such a simple job just to stand there to, be, uh, to bring honor to the temple. You can have any, any uh, you know, any Joe Schmo can do that. Why do we have to take the best of the best? And that's precisely the point, because this wasn't just a simple task. This was bringing honor, not to a physical structure, but to the one who commanded to build it, i.e. God himself. And therefore, the guards couldn't be some average person or an average citizen, but it has to specifically be someone of, of, a, of a high spiritual caliber. And they got a temple, and, uh, and, they, and they, they basically, that brought certain honor, right? Not too different to if anyone's been to England and seen the changing of the guards at Buckingham Palace, right? Certainly today, those guards aren't really doing much, to be honest. They're, they're just there. They have their big fur hats. Um, it's an infra, I forgot what it's called, but I'm no doubt that the royal family has real top secret service that's actually protecting them and they're just there for display um, and so on. But it brings honor, it brings a certain level of majesty. It's like a wow, it brings an aura to the palace, to the royal family. So that's a similar concept. You have, you have these people there, they're stationed there all night. The Ramam says specifically at nighttime because during the day they were participating in the service. So if they're busy with the, serve, the temple service, that's what brought honor to God. There are some opinions that say that even during the day there was guards, but this is the, the opinion of Maimonides. Fine, so this is a, a simple, uh, interesting mitzvah that existed during the times of the temple. Now, we explained, the Ramam explained that what was the reason for this, not to do with fear of the, of the enemies or robbers, but it was to, to bring honor to the divine presence that rests there. Um, and regarding the divine presence that rests there, so actually, in a different law, where the Ramam descri describes uh, there's another mitzvah to have respect, or to have a, a, a awe of, of the temple uh, surroundings and environment when you're there. And the Ramam explains that it's not fear of the building itself, but he uses the same language, but fear of or awe of the one who commanded the building. And he explains, he says that the holiness of the temple and the city of Jerusalem is due to the divine presence, and the divine presence is never nullified. He codifies this in a book of Jewish law. In other words, according to Maimonides, who lived in the 1100s of Spain, so this is long after the exile had already begun, he says, till today, the divine presence in that area is still there. It's still considered holy. Because of that, the Rebbe, when discussing this mitzvah, has a simple question. Why don't we find that the mitzvah to stand guard, if the whole purpose of the guards was not for the building, was never about the building, it was about the divine presence that, that's what made the building holy. Then why don't we have gods today? Why don't we have right now, standing on the Temple Mount, and we'll get to the contentious aspect hopefully later, but why don't we have uh, gods standing there right now? Not, we're not talking about God like RDF soldiers. We're talking about honorable rabbis, scholars, leaders, standing there studying Torah, praying, and, and that bringing honor on like a, almost like a 24-7 uh, basis. It would seemingly nothing's changed, right? The divine presence, says, the Maimonides says, still exists. In fact, we see a proof of this, and this is in the next source. Um, in temple times, there were rules about how a person was supposed to conduct themselves. You know, where, where a person was allowed to go, which parts of the, the temple area there was access to. So in the, in the next source, the Ramam describes the laws about how a person is supposed to behave in the temple area. Indeed, and nowadays, if you go uh, to the temple, the entrance to the Temple Mount, there's actually a sign there by the chief rabbinate of Israel placed there, warning people that it's forbidden, strictly forbidden, on a legal basis, Jewish law, halakhically, to enter that area. You're not allowed to go there. 
there are some rabbis that maybe find exemptions, but most um, most the consensus is that this is this is strictly forbidden uh, for the simple reason that it's a very holy site, as as the Rambam says, the divine presence is still there. We don't know exactly the, the exact uh, parameters and dimensions of the Temple Mount. We know it's in that vicinity, and therefore we go you know we go through the strictest opinion um, that basically we, we we go like all it's all off limits. We don't go there because basically we're all in a state of ritual impurity. Uh, today we don't have the ashes of the red heifer and so on that won't happen when, when Mashiach comes and therefore priest, Levite, Israelite, doesn't matter your, your social status, strictly off limits. The point of what we're saying over here is that we see that we're so careful, we're so strict about not entering this area. Why? Based on what we just read earlier, because the Rambam explains divine presence cannot be nullified, which is also just on a side point, a very powerful idea. All the enemies in the, enemies in the world and all the all the uh, you know, attacks and uh, atrocities that happened during that time, nothing can destroy the Divine Presence. God, you can't kill God. And therefore, God is always there. And because God's presence is always there, therefore we have to always show respect, and hence, till today, we have this law. Which is a fascinating thing, that an ancient law still has practical consequences till today, even though we don't have a temple. So with that logic, it wouldn't be so far-fetched to extend that and say, so why don't we have guards? If the whole purpose of the guards wasn't it also was nothing to do with a physical temple, it was about what made the temple special. Who said the temple is just a building of bricks and stones? God is the one who made it something holy. God said, "This is my home." So if that's what God says, and that's what made it holy, so then we need guards to honor God. God is still there. His physical structure is not there, but God is still there. So why don't we have guards the same way? We're also careful not to walk into the temple now. So this issue was actually discussed at length. Uh, in a book over here, you see it's called Mishkanot La Avir Yaakov. It's a safer, it's a, a work um, by a rabbi called Rabbi Moshe Hillel Gelbstein. This is more of a, a fascinating um, historical uh, point which reinforces our question. So, just to kind of explain to where we left off, our question is basically is why is it that till today, today we don't have or we don't seem anyone practicing the mitzvah, one of the six thirteen commandments, no less, uh, to guard the temple. So in 1869, the concept of guarding the temple actually became a very practical matter when this rabbi, Rabbi Hill Moshe Gelbstein, he arrived in Jerusalem, and he was born in Poland, he was a great, uh, he, he, served, he learned under some uh, great Hasidic masters, the Kotzka Rebbe, uh, the Chidush uh, Yarim, actually the Tzemach Tzedek, one of the Chabad rabbis. But he made Aliyah, he traveled to Israel at 34 years old. And when he got to Jerusalem, right away, when he got there, he started his campaign to encourage the residents of the small community over there, the Jews are very small at the time, to start, taking, to start guarding the temple, to start instituting temple guards. And basically he had this whole grand plan where he was going to have, um, he was going to have different groups of priests, Levites and Israelites, and they were going to just be studying the laws of the temple and the laws of the sacrifices and all the different things, all things temple related. And that was going to be their, um, that was going to be like their, their guard. Thank you. That was going to be their, their standing guard. Uh, but this is, you know, he's 34 years old. This didn't really uh, take off very well and it was dismissed, but not one to be uh, rejected. He spent the next 40 years campaigning on this. Can you imagine? He was, he was passionate about this. It's very interesting. And what, what, the point that we're bringing out is that we find in the 1900 years that we've been in exile until around this point in history, in the 1800s, nobody ever did this. Nobody ever took this mitzvah seriously. Nobody ever considered that maybe we should have guards in the temple. So one rabbi, a brilliant rabbi, no less, but still, it was only, he was a lone opinion, shows up in the 1800s and says, we have to have guards. We have to do this. And he writes an entire work called Mishkanot La Avri Yaakov, which is a book dedicated to this topic. And he brings numerous proofs and sources and opinions, and, he, and really a, it's a brilliant work and it's fascinating in the history and, and Torah scholarship and all kinds of Talmudic analysis and discussions, all to kind of bring out his point that, um, that, we need, that actually we still are, we're supposed to have guards today, according to him. And he corresponded with many rabbis in Israel and in the diaspora. And in 1875, so he's spending like 40 years campaigning this. In 1875, he, uh, he met, uh, well, he arranged a meeting with Sir Moses Montefiore, who uh, was already a big supporter of Israel. This was like his sixth or seventh visitor at the time. 
He was a major philanthropist, famous, famous individual. So he writes a whole letter, I'll read the letter quickly to, to Sir Moses, explaining his, um, explaining his plan. And he wanted to basically purchase, let me go back to the picture in a moment, he wanted to purchase by the Western Wall in the uh, Arab quarter houses that would basically, he would use those as like uh, homes for these, for these uh, yeshiva students or, or anyone really, priests, Levites and Israelites. And they were gonna have a constant like rotation, like guards, 24 seven, non-stop. There should always be a group of people studying in Torah or, or praying and so on. So this is the letter he writes to Sir Moses. God has granted me the opportunity to rectify a great issue, to repair a breach. So he considered this a serious uh, mistake that for thousands of years, no one took this seriously. There is a mitzvah in the Torah to have guards around the temple. The priests, the Levites would stand there each night without fail. With God's help, I have concluded that this mitzvah is applicable even nowadays when the temple no longer stands, for its sanctity is eternal, which is true, as we saw before. We must establish a guard around the temple and the houses close to the temple and the western wall, at the gates and the corners. There must always be priests and Levites guarding the honor of the temple. There should also be God-fearing Israelites who pray there regularly on behalf of the Jewish people. When the great rabbis agree with this, we will need to purchase or lease the structures near the temple, literally surrounding the temple mount, Believe me, your honor, the righteous Sir Moses Montefiore, if you were to know how great this mitzvah is, you would jump with joy that you have the merit to fill the mitzvah from which our salvation will come, God willing. He was a great fundraiser. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so he, he, uh, he tried convincing Sir Moses, um, uh, but I don't think he worked. But he continued to work on his plans to acquire these, these lots over here. So this is actually... I don't think it's called today this, but it's, it was called the Mugabari uh, Quarter. What but is there now? It's, it's the Muslim Quarter. Ah. And actually part of the tragedy of it is that the Western Wall extends. I didn't know this only just now when I was there last week, um, that basically the, the huge chunk of the wall is actually used as the fourth wall for many of the residents that live here. So it's like our holy site oh. is being used for someone in someone's bedroom, you know, like <clears throat> very interesting because um, it extends. So. He continues his plans. He, want, he basically wanted to acquire three lots in this quarter near the Western Wall so he could establish daily... He wanted to basically make yeshiva or, or, or a chabad house or whatever, study halls, um, prayer services of, of Torah scholars. And the act very interesting. He wanted to have three different types of groups. He wanted to have Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and uh, Ariza. The, the different uh, liturgies, the different uh, traditions. He wanted to cover his bases, you know, to have, make sure you have every type of Jew that's there, that's praying, that's honoring the temple. And again, in 1888, he raised a lot of money, 270 gold Napoleon, it says. Um, and he, he got the money, actually, he tried something. When, when, when Sir Moses didn't work out, um, and the other, the last minute, the owners backed out of the sale, he got involved with another great, well-known philanthropist, the Rothschild, Baron Rothschild, who also was a tremendous supporter of the original um, Jews that were coming to Israel and, and to settling him in the land. And Baron Rothschild was also very influential and he used his connections with the Turkish government. That's who the Israel was, was under their occupation. And he actually had the sellers agree once again to sell these, their homes, these lots, to Rabbi Gelbstein. And what happened? He was so close to accomplishing his goal, but the last minute, the Sephardic leaders, so this last time it was the, it was the owners themselves who backed out of the deal. The Sephardic leaders at the time actually sabotaged um, Rabbi Gelbson's plan. They asked the Baron, Baron Rothschild, to stop the sale because they were worried that doing this was going to be a tremendous affront to the Arab neighbors and it was going to, uh, it was going to sabotage their relationship and, and, and create uh, potentially uh, it would be very dangerous to the Jews. And again, it didn't work out. And despite his long efforts, he was, he was ultimately he was unsuccessful. So it's a fascinating idea that there's only one person in history that we know, at least in recorded Jewish history, that attempted to do this. So the question is why? Why did no one else, seemingly it was such an important thing to this man, why did uh, so many great scholars, surely they were also courageous and self-sacrificed and, and did unbelievable things in their, in their careers, why was this something that was like never considered or never thought of? Yeah. And when the Rebbe raised this question, he actually extended the question to his own, pre to his own predecessors. And he says, actually, the question's even stronger when you're talking about my, my predecessors, meaning the previous Chabad Rebbe's, referring to specifically going back to the Alter Rebbe. Why? Because we know that the Chabad rabbis were also very passionate about raising money and getting involved in Jewish life in Israel. And um, this already started in the times of uh, in the Alter Rebbe, Rav Shnezan of Yadi, in the 1700s. So this is already before Rabbi Gelbstein comes into the spotlight. 
um, there was a massive large group of Hasidim that from Russia, that left Russia and Ukraine for the Holy Land. And they were led by the Rabbi Nachman of Atepsk, and they had a whole uh, uh, different students. There was about 300 people. This was a massive group. This was a huge uh, uh, flashpoint in history because it made up about 5% of the Jews at the time of the land of Israel. Um, so how are we going to sustain these, these immigrants? Now, just to explain to you why that was so important, Israel at the time, which is actually interesting, is already an observation made by Mark Twain, um, which ties into today's politics as well. But Israel at the time was a swamp. Nobody wanted to live there. It was, it was like all the curses and described in the Torah all came true. It was a deserted, disgusting, it was unlivable, uninhabitable. It made no sense to move there. So if you want to move to the land of Israel, you were signing yourself up for poverty. There was no, it wasn't high tech like you have today in Tel Aviv. It wasn't this, this you know, booming economy. It was nothing. It was literally just, a, it, was, it was a swamp land in the words of Mark Twain. So there was no like good dairy ice cream. Nothing. There was no country. country. <laughs> <laughs> the Lafa, no. Right, so. <laughs> ben Yehuda Street. None of these things were around then. Um, which is one of the fascinating, beautiful things about Israel that in this short seventy-year history, it was able to transform into this one of the most thriving, you know, economies in the world. Um, so right away, they needed to establish a fund for all this about three hundred or so Hasidim and, and different groups of Jews that were emigrating to Israel. So there was something that till today you could find. It's the oldest uh, charity. Is it the oldest Chabad charity? The oldest charity in general? I'm not sure. Um, that you can actually see by the cartel, by the Western Wall. It's called Kol Chabad. Um, you've probably seen their, their pushkas, their, their charity boxes. They're all over. And the Alter Rebbe, who, who founded this charitable, this, this organization, devoted a lot of time and energy. He wrote a lot of letters that you can actually find in the Tanya. In the back of the Tanya, there's a lot of letters where he writes correspondence uh, to different Hasidim and, 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 and impressing upon them the importance of donating money towards this cause. Even to those who had no money, he told them that they should take out a loan just to support the Jews of Israel. Mm. And it's like, what do you want from me? But it was a very, very important thing to, to, to help the Jews in the land of Israel. And so much so, it came at the cost of, almost at the cost of his own life. This was the primary reason that the Alter Rebbe, Shnei Zaman, the founder of Chabad, his opponents used this charity against him to, uh, to have him arrested. So we know there's a famous holiday in the, in the, in the Chabad calendar called Yud Tes Kislev, the 19th of Kislev, where we celebrate the Alter Rebbe coming out of prison and reorganizing the, the, the movement and, and uh, giving it a whole new meaning and, and, uh, and energy. So the, one, of the, one of the ways that his opponents got him arrested by the Russian government was by accusing him of treason. How so? Because they were able to point to, uh, I don't know if they had tax returns or whatever it was, or receipts, but they were able to find proof and evidence that he was raising money in Russia for the Jews of Israel. That was his personal reason. But they were able to manipulate it and make it look like, who was he raising money for? The Turkish government, the Ottoman Empire, who was actually at war with Russia, with the Tsar. So it was a very, uh, it was a very like, almost like an easy way to kind of frame him. He was raising money for the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jews in Israel, this, this uh, charity called Kol Chabad. They were manipulating it to make it look like he was raising money for the Turkish, the Ottoman government. That's who Israel was under occupation at the time before the British came and made it even worse. Um, um, yeah, and that's, and that's how they were able to accuse him. So we see that he really, really, almost at the cost of his own life, tremendous self-sacrifice, dedicating to making sure the Jews in, in Israel, everything, what they had what they need. Because of this, the Rebbe is asking a very simple question. They were able to, they demonstrated such self-sacrifice. Why don't we see that same energy, that same enthusiasm for having guards at the temple, going back to our topic? Why don't we see them have any effort, any consideration to kind of like this Rabbi Gelbstein, to raise money and, and coordinate and use their connections to establish uh, homes where people are, are guarding the Temple Mount? The question is even more pertinent to our time, because as explained in many sources, we are living in a generation that's it's, it's considered the, the, the footsteps of Mashiach, meaning we're at the, like the, final, the final rounds of exile, and already the, the beginnings of Mashiach are already ta starting, to, starting to begin, starting to seep in. And we know, obviously, when Mashiach comes, the Messianic era, the, the primary uh, focus point will be the temple, the third temple. It's going to come down from heaven, according to one opinion. So if the base of Mashiach is going to come, there's two opinions. One is that we're going to build it, and one's going to come down from heaven. So if we're going to build it, maybe this question doesn't stand. But uh, if it's going to come down from heaven, meaning it's already made, it's just going to be like an instant thing, so then you need to have gods right away. 
So the Rebbe suggested when he asked this question, we should have gods right now, because as the Rebbe himself was a tremendous believer and passionate the fact that Mashiach is imminent, so as soon as the temple is built, we'll already have guards. But we won't have to waste a second. We shouldn't waste any time. So even if you accept, even if you reject Rabbi Gelfson's opinion and you say that today, post-destruction, the mitzvah is not applicable, it will be applicable very any soon. moment, very soon. It could be right now. We, need to, we shouldn't really be sitting in Palm Beach. We should be getting ready. To answer the question the Rebbe says, after the destruction of the temple, when the Jews were exiled and uh, we were subjected to foreign rule, it's really a, a simple but profound explanation. Um, it, it simply became dangerous. And the matter of fact is, the Jewish principle, uh, that the concern for life, when life, one's life is endangered, that overrides everything. We, all the rules go out the window. When someone needs to, even if a potential life-danging moment, in other words, we don't even know for sure, like a woman that need, is going to labor, it might be a false flag, but we still break Shabbat or whatever it is you need to do to, to make sure that everything's okay and that, that she's healthy. And that's the same thing with any scenario. We, uh, the preservation of life is the number one thing in Judaism, in Torah. Um, so as we see today, the Temple Mount is a very sensitive place that, uh, you know, millions of people are very passionate about. And the Rebbe says, certainly when Israel was controlled by governments that oppressed the Jews, definitely it was, it was a dangerous thing to do. It was off limits. Again, danger, endangering one's life is, you, you don't do these things. But the Rebbe went further and said that even, even today, when the Temple Mount is under Jewish control, even today when it's considered, um, you know, the state of Israel, the government officially has control over it, the soldiers are stationed over the IDF soldiers, they're not honor gods, they're armed gods. It's different. Um, but the fact is, and this, is a, this really gives you insight to the Rebbe's, uh, I guess, uh, foreign policy or how Israel should conduct itself with its, with its neighbors. Even today, when Israel officially has peace deals with Jordan, with Egypt, and so on, the Rebbe said he still can't neutralize the threat of some random fundamentalist whose, whose blood will boil at the sight of a Jew standing in what he considers a very holy site. So it, it might be holy, it might be important, it might be something you crave to have that spiritual connection. The fact is, it's going to endanger not just your life, but many other people's lives. And there's actually even a letter from the Rebbe on this topic, where the Rebbe writes to someone. Um, the Rebbe says that he's strongly opposed to even raising the topic. The rabbi writes in a letter to someone who was inquiring about the, his opinion about the Temple Mount, different rabbis have different opinions. You could go, you shouldn't go, you can go over here, you can't go over there. The rabbi said, not only is that all off limits, even the mere conversation, just talking about it, having this discussion is inappropriate. Why? Because you're going to rile up certain people. And even if officially we have peace with certain neighbors, the fact is that there's always individuals. You can't destroy an ideology necessarily, as, as you hear uh, many times in this, in this current war. And uh, as much as you can destroy the, you can, you know, delegitimize and discredit the, the government and you can, you know, uh, kind of neutralize their, their uh, state threat. But there's always individuals, there's always radicals, there's always extremists who are crazy and, and can do crazy things. Um, so therefore, the Rebbe said, better not to do it. If that's the case, so what do we make of all this, uh, of these... Um, you know, of all this discussion. It seems like the whole thing was just a waste of time. The bottom line, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't have guards. We shouldn't attempt to go there. It's just dangerous. So this is an important point that the Rebbe stressed many times, and this you find in the last source, that when God told the Jewish people to build a temple, God said, This is the last source in your paper. God says, You shall build for me a tabernacle, and I will dwell amongst them. And the sages know the very precise language over here. It says, I will dwell amongst them. What's them? It should say, we're talking about a physical structure. I will dwell amongst it. God is saying, build for me a temple, and I will dwell in this temple. Why is he saying dwell amongst them? As sages explain, because God is saying, where's the real temple? The Saikam, them is the every Jew, every man, woman, and child. In the hearts of every individual, that's where I want to dwell. And therefore, even if physically we don't have many of these mitzvot, which will only happen when Mashiach comes, when we have the authority to do these things, right now, we can still fulfill these mitzvahs, at least on a spiritual, psychological, and emotional plane. So this is one such example. The Rebbe says, what does it mean to build a tabernacle in our personal lives, a miniature temple? It means transforming our homes, our environments, our office spaces, using these things, using our material um, possessions for, for spiritual positive purposes, right? If I, you know, if I have the blessing to live in a home, invite guests over for Shabbat, for, for something uh, meaningful. Um, 
the Rebbe spoke about specifically for children to put uh, prayer books and, and different uh, and, uh, charity books on their shelves. But the Rebbe said, well, that's, that's the idea of building a tabernacle. In other words, utilizing our material gifts for spiritual pursuits. But more than that, what does he mean the idea of guarding it? Guarding is the idea of showing honor, meaning showing that you care about these things. Right? The same way that you're, uh, you're so careful that your child shouldn't have his shoes on the couch, so too, in a similar sense, or even more so, we should be extra careful with our spiritual possessions, our spiritual drives, to, uh, to honor them, to give them the dignity they deserve. Don't just be satisfied with doing it, the basic requirement. If you're gonna buy a pair of fillin', buy a nice pair of fillin'. Get a nice mezuzah, uh, you know, not just like a basic, you know, one opinion that says it's kosher. Get an authentic kosher mezuzah, get an authentic kosher pair of fillin'. And to the same way you buy the latest iPhone and the best car and the best phone, so give that same pride and honor when it comes to spiritual pursuits. That's how we guard today's personal temple. And that's the lesson of today. May it be sp immediately spilt in our days um, with the coming of Mashiach. Fantastic. Amen. Amen.